Hello, everybody. Um, we're gonna we're about to start our second panel. Uh, before we do, I want to kindly ask people that I know we're having an invigorating and wonderful discussion. And if you want to ask a question, please remember to make it short and that it has to end with a question mark. Um, so for our second panel, um, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk to some amazing experts that are there on the field in Mexico, but also internationally, and that have had a lifetime of experiences in understanding what works and what doesn't work, and the lessons learned from providing care to vulnerable populations. Um, so our first speaker is Paul Spiegel. He is here, as everyone can see him, <laughs> in our, um, with our amazing technology system. So Dr. Spiegel is a physician by training, um, and he is the director for the Center for Humanitarian Health at Jobs Hopkins University. He is internationally recognized for his research on preventing and responding to complex humanitarian emergencies. Before becoming the director of the Center for Hum Humanitarian Health, Dr. Spiegel was a deputy director of the Division of Program Management and Support Services for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Prior to joining the UN in 2002, Dr. Spiegel worked as a medical epidemiologist in the International Emergency and Refugee Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Spiegel has also worked as a medical coordinator with Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, and Médecins du Monde, Doctors of the, World, uh, of the World, in refugee emergencies, as well as a consultant for numerous organizations. Uh, and we also have Dr. Eunice Rendon, who serves as, a, as the coordinator of Migrant Agenda, or Agenda del Migrante, a citizen initiative and coalition of organizations in the United States and Mexico for the empowerment and defense of the rights of migrants. She is also an international consultant on migration and security issues and is a representative in Mexico of Chicanos por la Causa. Dr. Rendon has held several government positions. In the Ministry of Health, she served as Director General of International Relations, as well as a Deputy Minister of Prevention and Citizen Participation of the Ministry of the Interior. She's a former Director of the Institute of Mexicans Abroad, a decentralized body of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Until April 2019, she worked in the Ministry of Security and Protection as the Executive Deputy Minister of the National Public Security System. Dr. Rendon is an expert in migration, violence prevention, and economic recovery strategies in vulnerable populations. We also have Kieran Lanning, who is the Senior Technical Advisor for Emer Emergencies, Violence Prevention, and Response in the International Rescue Committee. Kieran Lanning is, a, um, yeah. uh, in, in this role, she is responsible for the IRC's emergency protection responses worldwide. She manages a team of emergency responders leading on women's protection and empowerment, child protection, and protection rule of law programming in emergencies. Kieran has established and led, and led protection programming in more than 15 countries during acute crises. Notably, in the past five years, she has directly deployed to or supported remotely every emergency response IRC has launched for mixed migration, including in Europe, Libya, Colombia, Colombia, Venezuela, and through the Northern Triangle to the Northern Mexico border, and has led the development of the IRC's guidance to integrate protection into Ebola response and preparedness efforts in the Great Lakes region. Prior to working with IRC, Kieran worked on emergency responses with multiple organizations, working in Libya, South Sudan, the Philippines, following the typhoon Haiyan, and along the U.S.-Mexico border in response to the large number of unaccompanied children arriving from Central America in 2003. Uh, professor Thomas Kria is an associate professor and chair of the Global Practice Concentration and Assistant Dean of Global Programs at the School of Social Work in Boston College. He is a former licensed clinical social worker with previous experience as a mental health therapist for severely emotionally disturbed children, and as a foster care adoption worker and supervisor providing home study assessments and post-placement supports to families. Dr. Kriya has experience in local, national, and international research projects related to social intervention for vulnerable children and families. Dr. Kriya's research focuses on the intersection of child welfare, refugee social protection and education, and strengthening humanitarian aid and international development programs. His research span, spans multiple countries, which in addition to the US have included Guatemala, Honduras, Kenya, Malawi, Palestine, Sierra Leone, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. 
And our wonderful distinguished panel will be moderate, moderated by Professor ja Jacqueline Baba, who is a professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. She is also the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Lecturer in Law at Harvard Law School and adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is the director of research at the, at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, Harvard's only university-wide human rights research center. From 1997 to 2001, uh, Jacqueline focused and directed the human rights programs at the University of Chicago. Prior to 1997, she was a practic practicing human rights lawyer in London and at the Euro European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. She has published extensively on issues on, on, of transnational child migration, refugee protection, children's rights, and citizenship. So please uh, join me in welcoming our, our panel. Um, Paul, if, you, if you'd like to start, start us off. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers. Can you hear me well? Yes. OK, excellent. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what uh, public health practitioners can do to try to influence the, uh, the situation in a, in a nonpartisan fashion using, uh, using evidence. Um, what we've been trying to do with many of the students and professors here is to work with Congress. Um, and we've been working specifically with Congresswoman uh, Laurel, Laura DeLauro, um, who is the, um, she is the head of the Appropriations Committee, the chair of the Appropriations Committee for um, HHS. And sorry, I said Laura, I meant Rosa DeLauro. We've been working with her for many months now to try to um, provide evidence as to what are, if any, what are the international standards for holding, uh, for detaining migrants, and then trying to figure out what, uh, what is the actual situation occurring. And it, it does change over time. So we put together um, a bunch of different policy briefs for her, trying to use evidence. And then she has been sending um, some of these, for example, the one I'm going to discuss right now, which was looking at the uh, detention uh, standards. She has been sending them to the secretaries, uh, Alex Azar of Health and Human Services, as well as uh, at that time, Kevin McAleenan, who was the acting secretary of DHS specifically. <laughs> to try to get uh, answers to these various standards. So first and foremost is um, probably one of the most important areas is BID or best interest determination of the child. This is clearly written out in the UN Convention on the, on the Rights of the Child, uh, of which 193 countries have ratified this convention. In the past, I used to say there were only three countries um, South Sudan, Somalia, and the United States that haven't ratified it. Unfortunately, Somalia and South Sudan have. So to my knowledge, it's only the US that has signed but not ratified this convention. But in Article 9 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it talks specifically about child separation. And it says a child, I'm going to read, a child shall not be separated from his or her parents against their will, except when competent authorities subject to just judicial review determine in accordance with applicable laws and procedures that such a separation is necessary in the best interests of the child. Furthermore, it talks about the importance of maintaining personal relationships and direct contacts with the, with the parents when the child has been separated. Clearly, this has not occurred uh, in, in what has occurred in the last while with when children were separated. So Representative DeLauro did send uh, questions specifically to the two secretaries to ask when children were separated, were, was BID followed, and what, uh, how were they applied, and please give examples. Secondly, what we tried to do was to look at standards of care um, using different standards, both in terms of detention as well as, uh, in, as well as international standards. So we found three different, four different standards. We found number one, um, ICE uh, has standards for de uh, detainees. Um, ORR, the Office of Refugee and Resettlement under uh, Health and Human Services, have standards. But we were not able to find clear standards for CBP, the Customs and Border Patrol. And as you likely know, you, the people come out, when people cross the border, um, they're detained by at CBP, Customs and Border Patrol facilities. 
in theory for a limited 72 hours, according to the florist agreement, but in practice, often much longer. The unaccompanied ch children under 18 years are moved to ORR HHS facilities, Health and Human Services, and the rest are, um, are moved and detained at ICE facilities. Um, so what we wanted to look at was what, what are the standards and which exist. And then, so we have ICE standards, we have ORR standards. The International Organization for Migration also developed standards together with Andalusian University for Eastern Europe. And then finally, we wanted to apply uh, humanitarian standards, which are called sphere standards in humanitarian settings. And we found pretty clear standards. They may vary in terms of exactly how, but we found clear standards for basic personal hygiene, access to toilets, access to showers, clothing, access to medications. I will read you just a couple. Um, and what we found, of course, is that these standards are not necessarily being applied in the same manner across different, um, different facilities. So we've all heard about issues of basic personal hygiene items not being provided. The ICE standards, the SPHERE standards, and IOM standards all require that detainees have basic personal hygiene items. And for example, ICE and IOM standards require that the detainee should receive one bar of soap, one comb, one tooth of tooth, tube of toothpaste, one toothbrush, one bottle of shampoo or equivalent. So they're very, very clear. So again, Representative DeLauro asked uh, the two secretaries, can you please provide very specific responses to what is happening in personal hygiene? I want to just skip to two others. And gosh, my time goes quickly. So I'm actually going to skip to one, two others. One is basic health care. There's been a lot of concern about what has been provided in terms of basic health care. All of these standards clearly have um, uh, requirements for basic health care, such as ICE stating that uh, the each detainee shall receive a comprehensive medical, dental, and mental health intake screening as soon as possible, but no later than 12 hours. Um, this is not happening in many of, of the uh, of the situ of many of the situation of many of the deep settings there. And I'm going to move because of time, because I see it's already six and a half minutes, to the flu vaccine. Um, we were able to look at the autopsies. There, to our knowledge, since December 2018 until July 2019, there were six children that have died in detention. Out of those six children, we reviewed the autopsies. Three of them died of flu vac of complications due to influenza. Um, ORR and HH, ORR and ICE facilities do have the option of providing flu vaccines, but CBP has specifically said that they will not and do not provide flu vaccines because of it's, it's um, they say, logistically difficult. Yet they do treat scabies and other skin diseases uh, there. So that is problematic, but they've said they do not treat, uh, they do not provide flu vaccine. So we, we've written a letter to uh, Rosa DeLauro explaining and, and uh, Royal Albard of DHS, DHS to explain the risks and the reasons why flu vaccines should be provided. And um, uh, Secretary DeLauro has written an email, on a, uh, an official letter on October 4th to Dr. Redfield, the head of CDC, clearly saying, listen, you say that CDC supports vaccinations, um, asked if you advised if THS, if they provide, should be providing flu vaccines, he says, we don't tell them exactly how they need to operationalize it, but we do believe that vaccination, particularly as early as possible, is a recommendation. So I'm going to end because of time, but the main purpose of my talk right here was to, number one, show how evidence can and should be advocated for to try to make a difference. I must say up, up front that I do not have responses in terms of have the secretaries of HHS and DHS responded, nor am I aware at this point that Dr. Redfield has responded to Representative DeLauro, um, which begs into question, well, are, is this being effective in terms of advocating in this way? And I think that's going to depend on a lot of various factors that I'm happy to discuss with, with the audience. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Talia, Megan, and all the people that make it possible. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to be here and also to hear like the last panel with all these uh, experiences and also our last participant, which also point out very important problems in terms of health and on, on, in terms of the interventions we have to do with evidence base. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have seen as Agenda Migrante and the organization we work with in, uh, in our two borders, especially in the northern border of Mexico, because I think there's we have a very special challenge and problem today. And uh, all the caravans and all the, the announcements that uh, President Trump had made and also all the mediatic uh, uh, things we have last year uh, make more invisible the northern uh, border problem. But we have two special problems there that we have to do something. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and some of the intervention we are doing or, and governments are trying to do over there also. So migration, as we all know and, and we already heard, is a global phenomenon. And according with the International Organization of, Migra of Migration, there are one billion mi migrants in the world today, of whom 300 million are international migrants, and 763 million are internal ma migrations. As we already heard, there is it's also very important movements inside the countries. One in seven of world population. So migration, migration is a reality, and it's, some, it's, it's something uh, not new, as, as, as we already heard. 68 million of the world internal and international migrants are forcibly displaced today also. So it's a huge, huge challenge that we have in front today. No? More people are on the move now than ever before. So we, we have some changes in this, in, in this perspective. Woman, woman migration is not a new phenomenon, as we already know, but it has changed significantly in number, in flows, and in nature due to, due to different dynamics. For example, growth of globalization, the push and pull factors uh, of shifting capital, effects of climate change, and periodic, periodic political upheaval, including armed conflict, for example. And I want to, to underline uh, poverty, and also I want to underline violence, because we all always talk about poverty, lack of opportunities, that, that is a very important reason in Central America especially. But last years, I, I have been working with a lot of migrants, with the people that were in the caravans. We have these massive caravans and, and other people that come in little groups. And one of the main, also we work in Agenda Migrante with a lot of, of lawyers, especially in Boston. We, we work with uh, migrant lawyers uh, in order to help migrants with asylum cases and with different cases of, of their defense. And some, something that I have to underline is the reasons they are moving now is principal violence reasons, the risk of losing their lives. So that's something very important because we have to look also for responses, not only in terms of poverty or of, or of opportunities and economic dynamics, but also in terms of violence, what we are going to do to prevent violence in the, in the countries they are going out from. So that's something very important. And also, we have seen that the rapid increase of population movement has important public health implications and therefore requires an adequate response from health sectors, but also of other sectors as well. It's not only the, the, the health sector that is going to change or, or to front these problems. We have to put to work together or intersectoral uh, uh, strategies and actions. And uh, also we know, as, as we heard uh, in the, with the last panelist, that uh, United Nations and a lot of conventions and agreements underline the right of everyone, including migrants and refugees, to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and is established in the Constitution of WHO of 1948. But nevertheless, Many refugees and migrants often lack access to health services and financial protection for health, as we already see with all the experiences we heard here today. Mexico is a country with all the phases of migration. It's a, it's a country of, of, of expulsion or expelled people, transit and return. 
uh, uh, internal migration and reception. And I want to underline these two phases, transit and return, because I think th this, these two phases are the challenge we have in our northern, northern uh, border today and are, are the actual problems and opportunities we have. Why? Because uh, transit is, is uh, transforming into in reception. Because all the change we have seen uh, with US policies, US migration policies impact and affect Mexico. So all the, the decisions that pr President Trump and the American administration have made have an impact in, me in Mexico. So we have seen the remaining Mexico police, but we also uh, see, have seen other other policies uh, going uh, uh, going on, and so now we have all the deportees because we used to have three flights to Mexico City, and we and now the the United States canceled these three flights since like one year and a half ago. So all the deportees are coming back from these points. We have 11 points in our northern border, especially in some very dangerous places in terms of violence. And also we have, with all this policy of remaining in Mexico, we have more than 50,000 people waiting for their responses or, or or, or their processes of, of asylum in the states. So we have all these people in, in, in our border and we need to face that with different, uh, uh, with different policies. First of all, what we, what, what we have seen is we need also to, to, to have our own priorities because as we can see in this, in this um, slide, we are doing the job for the states. As you have see, as you can see, we are deporting more Central American people than they do, do, than they do. And also, this is just to say that young people is a, a, and people in in age of work of working are, are migrants here. And uh, so, in order to provide hum, humanitarian. Um, assistance and, and interventions, we think that we have to work especially with productive projects. We have to, uh, to, to work in like uh, shelters, but we have to make productive shelters. We have to, to do it sustainable because we have a lot of people there and without any planning and, and without any resources there. Also, we have seen with caravans a lot of epidemic and health care uh, problems. And uh, finally, and I'm going to, to finish here, I think that children are one of the most important things we have to, to underline in these migrations, especially with mental health, uh, mental health assistance that we need, because children and also deportees are, are suffering a lot of living their lives in other parts of, of the world. Uh, there is a difference between Trump and Obama, which is the profile of the migrants that they are deporting. The, the deportees of Trump are people that have more more history, more time, more families, more, more, more everything in the States. And that, that is a very difficult challenge to Mexico in order to, to reintegrate them to our country. So I think that we have to think on that and to, to think it productively also. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thanks. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the International Rescue Committee, or IRC, um, but it's an organization, an organization I work for, uh, that works across many types of humanitarian responses that have been caused by conflict, natural disasters. We work in refugee hosting countries, as well as countries receiving asylum seekers, and refugees for resettlement. So we kind of see populations on all sides of these types of crises. Um, in preparation for this panel, I really tried to reflect on the mixed migration responses that IRC has been a part of over the past five years. Um, we use the term mixed migration, which refers to cross-border movements of people, including refugees, fleeing persecution and conflict, and victims of trafficking, as well as people seeking to for better lives and better opportunities. This term really captures the movement and diversity of this population. Um, some examples that IRC has worked in uh, include the Europe response, the Venezuela crisis, um, Libya, Central America, 
And there are basically three lessons that I'd like to center around, hopefully, for the next five to six minutes. Um, but the reality is that I think we could probably spend the next couple of months unpacking each of these, which I think we're seeing that trend across the panels, unfortunately. Um, the first is that we're seeing shifts in patterns of displacement. As humanitarian agencies, we've historically worked in fragile contexts with poor development, weak systems, and weak governance structures. Recently, we're seeing more of a shift to middle-income countries, who are now grappling with humanitarian crises, which include the Syria response region, it includes the Europe response, Venezuela and the surrounding countries, and also Central America and now Mexico. As a result, we're providing services through and alongside more existing service providers and systems, and sometimes with more sophisticated finance models like insurance and vouchers. And that's forcing us to adapt our minimum standards and guidelines around programming. We often have to evaluate if an existing healthcare system or social protection structure can actually absorb the number of people that we're talking about. And we also have to monitor it because this is a very dynamic and shifting context and it changes depending on population flow. Another shift in patterns of displacement that we've seen are families are often moving multiple times in their countries of origin before being displaced outside of those countries. In the Northern Triangle alone, we see upwards of 700,000 individuals that displace on an annual basis. So what we're seeing on the border is just the tip of the iceberg. And really, it's indicative of a much larger regional crisis. The second, the diversity of the population is immense, and I think we've heard a lot of that today, including nationality, culture, languages, economic resources, education, and legal status. On top of that, people use varied coping strategies, with some people intentionally trying to be less visible due to safety, which also makes it harder for us to reach them with services. Therefore, the needs are wider in scope, depth, and, com and complexity, and often more costly. And they're requiring more sophisticated approaches in analyzing need, access, marginalization, and barriers to services. So we need to better understand how diversity of the population impacts access both real access and perceived access. For example, in more developed and often urban settings, we sometimes make assumptions that populations have access to services. Once registered under MPP, individuals can seek health care for up to three months. But due to discrimination, limited financial resourcing so they can't reach the clinic, fear of authorities, and reporting requirements, families may not feel comfortable seeking those services or navigating those complex systems. We also need to monitor, put monitoring mechanisms in place because this is very fluid. So again, barriers one day might not be barriers the next day, and vice versa. And that's due to new risk factors, misinformation, changing policies, xenophobia, and patterns of exploitation. And I think this is really important to highlight is the level of violence and exploitation in some of these contexts has really shaped this crisis. In the case of Mexico, many people are fleeing transgenerational violence. MSF estimates that approximately 68% of migrants, asylum seekers, and returnees have experienced some form of violence in their journey to and through Mexico. And that's disproportionate to women and girls, who on average, we estimate about 80%, have experienced rape or sexual assault during that same journey. So upon arrival in Mexico, these populations have significant protection and mental health psychosocial support needs. And then the risk of violence and exploitation continues to increase as populations are waiting for their asylum procedures in often very insecure locations. Lastly, the dynamic nature of these types of responses really requires adaptive programming. Populations are often not looking for sectoral solutions. They want service providers to address complex issues in the most efficient and easily accessible ways. In these contexts, as IRC, we've had to adapt our progr programming to be more integrated across sectors. We've also had to pair or couple static facility-based models with more mobile approaches or mobile service delivery models. And Mexico is a great example of populations with limited mobility that have required service providers to actually bring services into the shelters and to meet populations where they are. Additionally, mobile populations present a challenge with the continuity of care. Most of our services require regular contact with patients or clients. 
However, those models have to be adapted when you're uncertain how long you will be working with that patient or client. This can be super disruptive to treatment and recovery, but without modifying those approaches, our services are ineffective. And in some cases, like mental health and psychosocial support or protection service delivery models can even be harmful. So in these cases, it's really critical to assess whether a person intends to move quickly, whether they plan to stay for a while, and then adapt care plans accordingly. Often that's a bit of a moving target with that population. So due to the protracted nature of mixed migration crises, it's important that humanitarian programs address survival needs as well as linking those programs to more durable solutions quickly. This requires supportive policies of asylum seekers and refugees to work and gain access to their full entitlements. As you can imagine, this is highly political given Mexico's relationship with the US and it's had a, a challenging, if not depressing impact on the funding and support from donors for this particular context. These are contexts where we need donors to bridge development resourcing with humanitarian resourcing in order to create that continuity of care. So all of that to say, these are super unique, if not challenging and complex contexts. Um, as an international humanitarian organization, we continue to learn and adapt our programs. We've been doing this on a number of different contexts and despite having been at it for a number of years, we're still learning. I'll stop there, thanks. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Cray. I'm an associate professor of social work uh, at Boston College. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, reflect on some of the experiences that I've had leading research projects in various parts of the world. Um, uh, I have not had experience working in Mexico, um, and I'm hopeful that some of the observations that uh, I've gained just through my own observations and then through the findings of some of our research projects might be able to inform some of uh, the responses that were uh, to the problems that we're hearing about today. Um, so to give you a sense of some of my background, um, I'm uh, primarily, a, primarily a researcher and evaluator. Uh, I often work uh, in partnership with NGOs like Jesuit Refugee Service and Catholic Relief Services. Uh, and I focus on um, social, uh, social interventions for refugees and other vulnerable populations uh, with a particular focus on capacity building. Uh, so the work that I've done um, previously and currently, uh, a lot of it's been in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, much of which is in the context of refugee camps, uh, working to uh, build uh, programs of higher education for refugees, uh, and also uh, special needs programming uh, for uh, uh, children uh, who are refugees, uh, and also building livelihoods for uh, refugees in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I've also done quite a bit of work with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service here in the United States, uh, uh, looking at uh, mental health, employment, and educational outcomes for unaccompanied immigrant children who are placed in ORR foster care, which is a federal foster care system that operates uh, in parallel to the domestic foster care system. And I also run a large NIH-funded study of uh, children's mental health outcomes who were affected by Ebola in Sierra Leone. Um, so as I reflected on these various projects and, and what we're finding and continuing to find, um, you can't necessarily take uh, the dynamics and findings from one location and, and extrapolate uh, it to another. Um, but some of the common themes that I've seen are that health and mental health needs are uh, highly prevalent and in many cases largely unmet, um, and even in the United States, for example. So uh, for unaccompanied children um, who are in the foster care system, uh, uh, care providers have told us that they see a lot of uh, medical issues from kids coming from Central America, uh, ex extreme malnourishment, uh, stunting, um, a, a lot of dental problems, uh, especially uh, with kids from Guatemala is, is what I've been told. Um, 
one thing that we have not talked about very much, uh, although other panelists have mentioned that, is trauma and how um, uh, violent experiences, whether in um, children and adults, countries of origin, um, but also on the migration journey, and then upon their reception to the United States uh, and how they're treated there. Uh, all of this compounds trauma and affects uh, outcomes for um, kids and families, which reinforces um, the importance of having a trauma-informed perspective in whatever sector that we're working. So whether you're an educator, whether you are a physician, uh, whether you're a mental health therapist, having an understanding of trauma and how trauma um, lives in the body and how that is expressed in behavior uh, and so that you're interpreting that behavior appropriately, it's important to understand how that trauma happened and how it's manifesting so you, you best know how to respond to that kind of trauma. Um, another thing that uh, I've seen in other places uh, that I have not heard about in Mexico, but I wonder if it's the case, is uh, the experience of child maltreatment. Um, in other contexts that I've worked, child maltreatment is uh, commonplace, if not endemic, uh, and is often not questioned, which uh, begs the, uh, the need for um, child protection protocols and, and practices. Um, and I have uh, some other observations about that that I'll raise later. Um, another issue is uh, legal status. So most of the uh, migrants that we're seeing in Mexico uh, are undocumented. Um, it, and having even a, re a refugee status or an asylum seeker status opens up the possibilities for a lot, uh, some benefits and some rights. Uh, and so this is an especially marginalized population uh, that, that really are, it, it, in some ways, it's a violation of human rights, the, the, the limits um, to protection that this population has. So that leads me to some major questions that emerge for me uh, that I don't necessarily have answers to. Uh, I just raise them, ask questions, and maybe that can spawn some conversation here. Um, one is, what are culturally appropriate means of understanding and responding to mental health issues? So our, our knowledge of mental health is basically a Western oriented concept. Um, when care providers that I've talked to uh, work with unaccompanied children, uh, even when a counselor is available or a psychiatrist, and they want to refer the child to that um, mental health professional, uh, the child will say, well, I'm not crazy. I, I don't need that. But, but they don't, they, there's no language to articulate what mental health looks like from their cultural context. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think we have a lot of work to do to start um, building some bridges linguistically and conceptually about what we mean by mental health when we're working with populations that uh, do not have that same understanding. Uh, and a lot of times mental health problems will uh, become psychosomatic problems and, and uh, people will end up at doctor's offices with um, diagnoses that are unclear. Uh, and in which case, sometimes uh, they'll be referred to uh, mental health professionals to start working on those psychosomatic symptoms. Um, another question is, how does one balance cultural norms around, for example, corporal punishment uh, and child maltreatment um, or child labor in light of the, conventions, the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Um, this is a tension that I see in every place that I've worked um, where uh, these kinds of practices are happening, they're culturally normative, um, and yet we are under an obligation to uh, protect the child. Uh, and I don't have an answer to that. It's, it's a tension that exists, and, I, and I'm curious as to whether it exists in this scenario as well. Um, and then my final question is, at what point does a protracted humanitarian crisis demand development thinking from a systems perspective? Um, uh, the refugee camp where I've done um, the most work is Kakuma Refugee Camp. It's been around since 1992. Uh, it's designed to be an emergency uh, place of um, displacement, 
uh, and yet the average length of stay is between 10 and 18 years. So at what point do we stop thinking of this as a humanitarian emergency and start thinking of longer term plans to figure out how to meet people's needs most effectively? Uh, and that's a systems issue that, uh, as other panelists have discussed, we need to get people together and figure out a larger way of organizing services and responses to uh, the problems that uh, these people are facing. Uh, so I will conclude there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all four panelists for really very uh, stimulating and uh, remarkably concise um, presentations. What I'd like to do, if I may, is to start off by asking each one of you one question which arose from your presentation, and then asking one or two questions which I think all of you will have something interesting to say um, about, and then we'll open it up. So to start with you, uh, Paul, thank you very much for your you know, very clear account of the um, power of evidence. Um, the mechanism that you described was using the mismatch between standards that are prevalent and practice on the ground to try to create a, um, a, a pressure point for governments or for stakeholders who are responsible. So um, you mentioned the point of vaccinations, and I wanted to ask you, what do the standards that you were referring to say about that? Is there an option for, um, uh, for CBP to say, well, actually, we do not provide this vaccine it's not practical for whatever reasons. Is that a permissible response? Uh, if it is a permissible response, then what is the humanitarian community going to do about it in terms of standards? And if it is not a permissible response, then what are the next steps in terms of pressuring the US government? Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, in, no, it's, it would not, it's not permissible because um, there are, there are basic public health uh, implications for that, number one. Number two is that Centers for Disease Control, which is, and we're talking about now um, migrants and or asylum seekers in the U.S., um, have very clear standards. And they say both for um, U.S. and non-U.S. citizens, vaccinations are, should be provided because it's, it's of course, for the the people themselves, the, the detainees that would be in that such, such a setting. It would also help prevent spread for amongst those who are providing care and then when detainees and others are released uh, amongst the community. So it has both a, a, an immediate health response uh, for the detainees and a broader public health implication. Um, however, um, we've spoken to, well, we've spoken to people who have worked at CBP and it's really hard to understand uh, why they say no to this because um, it's very clear that it is recommended and they are providing um, health care in other areas. What they say is that in theory, um, these people will be uh, within 72 hours, which we know is not often the case, will be moved to, um, to either ICE or OR facilities where, it will, where these vaccinations will be provided. But in practice, that's not always the case. And so what we've done is to provide as much data as we can to, um, to, to Rosa DeLauro, who, because what we've had to do is look at where, who is providing the money. And because the decisions are not being made um, by those in charge, since they're not taking the public health into account, we're trying to look at, and the pressure point would be the money and trying to make the money dependent upon doing proper public health support. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Eunice, if I may just turn to you. So thank you also for your very interesting uh, presentation and you set out the scale of this issue very, very clearly. You talked about doing work in productive shelters and in, in kind of trying to do work which was sustainable. And I wondered if you could just say, how can you think about sustainability in a context where people are moving and where there is inherent transience? What, what would you count as a success in terms of, uh, of the sustainability of your work in that, in that context? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, I, I didn't finish all the idea, but I think that it can be sustainable if we, if we do it like in an intersectoral way 
also with private sector and with different uh, sectors in included, and also with a perspective of empathy, because I didn't say this word, but I think that for all what we have said today, the most important word is empathy, because all the things we hear about uh, a border, about all the systems and everything, have to understand what, what, what is the, the which are the, the problems and all the things that migrants are, are facing. And also, I think that it can be sustainable, because if you did with other actors of the, of the places, for example, in the border, we have a lot of enterprises that need people to work with, and, and, and we haven't connect that, that need with all the, all the demand that we have now with migrants, with those that, that used to pass and now they stay, and also with those that have gone to, to the States and now are they are coming back. And I think that is very important in order to have sustainable pro projects and to, to have it like in a, in a long-term uh, planification or plan, we need to include also the people that, that are in Juarez, in Tamaulipas, in the different places that have never gone and, and didn't have opportunities. They, they have also lack of opportunities and access because the, in this way, we are not only tackling the economic perspective, but also the racist perspective because a lot of people is racist and or, or they don't like all the cooperation and programs that uh, government and so, so civil society do for migrants because they feel fear or they feel that they need more the help, the help than the others. So also with productive projects that have hybrid uh, co components, we can also tackle racist racism. And also another important thing is that we have remittances. Mexico is one of the countries with more remittances in the world. And we have proved, we have made some pilots of that, of productive remittances. So we can also begin to, to work with this kind of with this money with this source of money in this kind of 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 shelters so the 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 secret the secret i think is to do something that have to something to do with the place we are working with for example in michoacan we have done some uh, fruit, de deshydratated fruits, some dried fruit, uh -huh, dried fruits, fabrics for from for dried fruits with all the women that were viudas. Um, Widows of violence. So we, what we design is we 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 study first of all which is the productive thing that we have there. We have a lot of fruit, a lot of agriculture. So what 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 we have done is we put a, a fabric of of the cedar trade products. So we give a value to the market that is already a market over there, and then we work with a lot of sectors in order to do it productive to have different. Uh, okay links and etc. So we can right. do something like Thank that. Thank you. Um, uh, Kieran, um, I wanted to ask you, it's fascinating what you were saying, and I think your point about um, the, uh, the three kind of differences is, was very kind of nicely captured. Uh, in particular, this, this notion that people are moving multiple times, and we see this in many contexts. We see this in the Central American context. Of course, we've seen this in the Syrian context. So people, by the time they come re become asylum seekers or refugees, they've been IDPs probably for quite a long time. And obviously, this creates huge challenges in terms of service delivery. So I wanted to ask you, how has the IRC actually thought this problem through? Because I know in some contexts, people are talking about having like a health card, you know, a migrant, because you can't be sure that the migrant's going to stay there, say if we're talking about vaccinations, and you have to have one or two or three installments of the vaccination, say for children. You want to have a card which records what you've already had, and you have it with you, carry it with you, uh, on the assumption that the, the, the kind of structure is not able to retrieve that information. So how do you do that in these situations where people are really not staying very long, and it's unpredictable how long they're going to stay. Do you have any lessons that you've learned, you, IRC, over the course of your work to make uh, kind of care more mobile or to make the care that's given to mobile communities more reliable and more integrated? So that's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was mentioned in the very first panel the importance of coordination. And I would say particularly in the case of northern Mexico, which is a response that's not well funded right now, coordination becomes paramount to these types of responses. 
So in some contexts, in the Europe response, for example, we had people who would come in on boats, they land on a beach, they start hiking many miles, they might jump on a bus and then show up at another shelter. And we had to then think about how do we triage their care, determine what we needed to address immediately, and then how do we communicate that between teams? And often, at least with the protection programming, there's a lot of sensitivity around who's capturing that information, who's sharing that information, confidentiality, consent, all of these things we had to navigate. Um, we've tried to think outside of the box. I don't know that we have a, a perfect solution for it yet, but a couple of ways that that's been handled in a few different contexts. In Greece, we actually came up with a, a process of sending SMS that would then have another mobile message that enclosed certain types of information so that we knew a case was coming on a bus. We could then meet that case with a case worker at that point, and then we could provide care from there on. We do have to modify our, our programs. Um, we can't do case management where we're looking at two months of care and support for populations. So we have to modify our approaches in that way. We also have to know what the service delivery at the, the back end looks like. So not just what do we see in the camp or the point of entry we're working in, but where are they going? And we have to have that mapped out. Um, in the case of El Salvador, we've actually put together um, out of the Europe response was born a platform called Signpost, which is using social media and other platforms to communicate with some of these communities and to address things like misinformation and also to make sure that they had information about where they were going and the service delivery aspect of that. We've modified that in El Salvador and it's called Cuentanos and it's a very similar platform but it's service provider facing. So if we have a family that is displaced from point A to point B, We've already mapped service providers in that area and we can provide referrals so that we have continuity of care. Um, the idea that we're really coordinating across agencies so that we can say we have a care network for some of these services. Oh, it's, just a quick follow up. So yeah. there's not, I mean, because we're sitting in, a, in the US, there's not a privacy concern. I mean, so you say, you know, the family of, I don't know, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so and the children, you know, have come, we, they, we, they have this medical issue but they're moving towards you, and so we'd like you to keep that's okay? Well, usually we go through a consultation with that family. So do they want services? This is what this would look like on this end. Is it all right if I share your information with this service provider? So we go through all the due diligence processes that we typically go through in case management, but sometimes it's done over a digital platform, or sometimes it's done with specific moderators or focal points. Um, the moderators on the back end who manage some of these services, the digital platform, they're trained in very specific curriculums and how to manage crisis counseling when it exceeds or needs to get elevated to a, a particular type of care and it's outside of their expertise. So there's a whole, and it's very complex and it's not necessarily my, no. my specialty, but those are some of the outside of the box ways that we've tried to address this. That's a great answer, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, I wanted to ask you, um, you, you raised the kind of very fundamental issue of culture. Um, and I wanted to ask you what, about what you said about child labor in particular. Um, my sense, uh, and I'd really you know, welcome a rebuttal if that's appropriate. My sense is that very often migrant uh, or distressed migrant communities um, are not the poorest of the poor like we see with uh, seasonal migration within countries where really often they are destitute populations. And a correlate of that is that very often these are not, these international distressed migrants are actually not families who, for whom child labor is habitual. But the new circumstances propel them into maybe unaccustomed poverty or destitution. They've run out of their savings. They don't, can't rely on family or other structures. I mean, in Syria, it's a classic example, I think. So um, in that context, how do you, how do you, you know, is, is it a cultural question or is it really a, a governance question that, you know, the, the host community, the humanitarian or governmental response has an obligation to provide a minimum level of, of support to avoid these sort of, you know, human rights abuses against children by putting families in, in predicaments where they don't have to make those sort of choices. I mean, is that, is that a reasonable response? Or would you say that actually, even if you did have the possibility of providing, you know, adequate, um, basic, you know, economic and social provision, you would still encounter this problem? 
I, I think there are multiple answers to that. I think on the receiving end, yes, certainly uh, there is an uh, obligation to respond to the basic needs of anyone who is uh, forced to migrate for whatever reason. Um, I think that in the context of Central America, um, what we've seen is a lack of economic opportunity coupled with increasing gang violence and general lawlessness. Um, I've worked in uh, Guatemala and Honduras since 2015 um, with CRS uh, uh, and uh, evaluating their food for education programs uh, in rural areas. And what we've seen, I've been there four times over the past four years or so, five times actually, uh, and what we've seen consistently is uh, school enrollment is going down every year. Um, and these are, these are poor communities. And the expectation is that when children, it seems to be, I don't know if it's for everyone, this is what I've heard, so it's anecdotal. Um, when uh, children are finished with primary school, that they will migrate. And with the idea of reaching the US and, and sending back uh, remittances. Uh, because there are no options, and uh, the alternative is being recruited by a gang, uh, and gangs are proliferating uh, in, 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 uh, in these particular regions. Um, so I think you know, there's, there's the push factors, um, but then there's the obligation um, to acknowledge that this is forced migration, that, that, uh, that, these, that people are faced with dire circumstances, that any one of us would flee, uh, you know, all things being equal. Um, and I think the response has been uh, more militarized versus humanitarian. Uh, before the crisis hit, we were talking about um, child welfare responses versus uh, legal responses. Um, now things have, have mushroomed to where it is a more, it seems to be a more milita militarized response. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, that, that just exacerbates the humanitarian issue, I believe. Right. Great, thank you. So if I may now, I'd like to ask a question for all of you to perhaps take a stab at, and then we'll, we'll open it up to, 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 to the, the floor. And the question is this. It really arose in different ways in all of your presentations, I think. You know, trauma as a health, we're talking about public health and responses to public health challenges that arise from, the, you know, the situation at the, uh, in Mexico in particular. So... Um, trauma, mental health, health need, I think, is acknowledged, and several of you actually mentioned this expli explicitly, to be a huge unmet need. There is also the question about um, the way in which mental health needs and the response to trauma are very culturally embedded, culturally coded. So how should... Uh, humanitarian interveners or other stakeholders, government stakeholders, think about this and cater for this, given that there are, you know, as you said, kind of very diverse populations. How should we be thinking about this? Um, are there any general principles like the principle of non discrimination or destigmatizing, you know, mental illness that we might adopt? Or is this going to be a kind of contingent response in each circumstance? In, circumstance just depending on the particular community do we need kind of cultural literacy to um, respond to particular particular situations I'm wondering if there are any lessons that we can learn about good practice that really are, are transferable across across different situations so anybody can can jump in who wants to um, to start with this any any thoughts Actually, I'm asking the panel first. Mm. Any, any, I didn't say anyone. I meant anyone. Is this, I am discriminating. Anyone who's on the panel. <laughs> yeah, Paul looks like you might have something to say. Yeah, thinking a little bit about um, what we've done with refugees in the past. Um, and then we have a group here at Hopkins that works just on mental health and, and, um, and, and communities is in humanitarian emergencies. Is, um, number one, try to divide between what is a trauma um, that needs medical uh, medical care, psychological care versus a trauma that a community goes through and that a community itself and the, and the individuals and the family members may be able to address? That would be number one. Number two is... So, so, so um, can you just explain to us, what is the, give us an example of the second. What's a trauma that the community might be able to address? Yeah. I think we understand the first. So, well, there are some... So there are traumas that may occur... Um, 
let's say that, let's say we 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 at least from in the medical field will clearly delineate between an exacerbation of schizophrenia or depression for a variety of reasons that may need a, a medical as well as a psychosocial. But then there are uh, there are um, traumas of uh, people moving, not having no livelihoods, not being able to um, to to address their the way they sh they feel that they should be acting in terms of their being a father, being a mother, being a child. And there, there are a lot of other programs, various psychosocial programs that can be done at the community level. Because what's clear is most of the time this shouldn't be medicalized except for those cases that need to be. So that would be number one. And then number two is, as was said, people, people and culture have a different way of expressing what it is like to be depressed or what it is like to be um, uh, the words for uh, how people maybe react uh, with sexual violence. So it's working with the communities to understand what constructs that we have and how that community relates, almost translating it to the way they can express themselves and then trying to work with them and the community leaders. Great, thank you. Yeah, other thoughts? Does anybody else want to jump in or, or make a comment? If, if you don't have anything to say, there's no... The only yeah, comment Thomas. I have is yeah. that uh, it, uh, what Paul's saying reminds me of what Father Kafia said, which is uh, that the community level traumas are a social justice issue. Uh, and the, the mental health can be uh, sort of a, a medicalized issue, but these larger issues are, are, um, are things that the community has to, wrongs that the community has to right. But my sense, too, is that they are also often issues of profound stigma, both within communities and across communities. So, you know, uh, when, when you say that people, you know, I think you said this, Thomas, that people, you know, signal or don't ask for, that it might be cultural not to ask for help. Um, it's partly because there's often shame associated with that. And so uh, enormous amount of shame and maybe shame and blame at the same time. You know, we are coping. Why aren't you coping? Uh, this is a kind of stain on the honor of the family. So um, those are kind of more... Um, really structural issues that we have to deal with. And again, it's very hard to deal with in the short term, I suppose, you know, going back to this point about, about people moving fast, yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time. Let me open it up. And uh, as was already said, you know what a question is. So please go ahead, introduce yourself and, and ask a question if you have one. So let's see if anybody has anything they want to say. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the beautiful uh, statements of Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, my background is in social work, and I was really taken by the word empathy. Uh, some time ago, there was a film documentary about these ladies in central Mexico, matronas, uh, taking care of the people who were coming through their area and giving them food and shelter for the moment and medication or whatever they needed at the time. And to me, you know, background in social work, that experience that people who are going through trauma uh, kind of change their perception of reality uh, uh, makes a big difference. Now, when you contrast with the cruelty is the point to have developed policies that really, it's not about these people coming over, but these people who are being degraded to the level of beyond humanity, coming in and developing policies that are really to get them to get back to their country because they don't belong here. The border is closed. And even the judges can tell us nothing about what's happening here because they're going to go back to the situation that they came from. Are there any models, <laughs> I had to go with the question, are there any models that kind of take away from the matronas, from these ladies, a, okay. little, a little bit of compassion uh, into these kids that are coming Thank through. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know. Actually, we, we, I wrote a book la, last year about the model taking account matronas, but also other kinds of efforts. For example, we were with deportees, deportees helping deportees. 
and it was very useful because the, even if it sounds <laughs> maybe a little bit strange, it, it was re very different. See, we have only like the politicians and the, 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 the institutions giving the attention to deportees. And if we have the accompaniment of the deportees, as we have done in, because as I already told you, we used to have three flights of deportees each week to Mexico City. Trump stopped that, and now these three flights come through the northern parts of our country. But when we used to have that, we came to take, uh, like, the, to receive, receive the deportees each week, but with a group of deportees. And that was very, that's what I uh, wrote, wrote this book, in order to do po public policy based on, on empathy and based also in the different kind of migrants that are arriving, because it's not the same one person that have been in the States for 40 years and all his, fam his family is here, everything is here, that is, is different from a person, a youngster that doesn't speak Spanish or every, every single story of their lives or, 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 or every single detail in their stories give you a different perspective. So in public policy, you, you cannot do a special policy for each one, but you can do profiles. So in this book, what I develop is three different profiles of for being more empathic with people that are coming back to Mexico for reintegration policies, that is what you are talking about, in all the holistic uh, vision. Thank you very much. OK, any other questions or comments? Yes. Thank you very much for your participation. No, you couldn't hear what you said, sorry. Thank you very much for your participation to the panelists and your work. With Obama, we have the trend of uh, wearing bracelets and ankle bracelets, and uh, it was one of the largest administrations that deported people. In Mexico, we are seeing now the, the same pr the same process in which we return migrants. Mi es esta. My question is this: en su en su punto de vista de cada uno, In your experience, esto mejorará o empeorará porque en la casa han ido congresistas, han ido a Estados Unidos y a México. Ellos qué opinan de esto? Mejorará o empeorará? Is in, in your opinion, is there hope? Is this, are things going to improve or not? Because there have been a lot of uh, people, congressmen, women, that have gone to the Casa del Migrante and uh, nothing changes. So just to repeat the question, uh, the question is, I, I are think. Are things going to improve? So you, you say um, that uh, from under the Obama administration, there was, was already large scale deportation. There were ankle bracelets and other oppressive tools used. Now we see a much more dramatic set of policies. So can we expect things to improve or do we think they're going to stay the same or deteriorate? Is yes. that basically? OK, yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> crystal, crystal ball time. Um, does anybody want to hazard a, uh, I guess, I don't know who wants to say, I mean, maybe uh, Chris, 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 Kristen or um, Kieran, sorry. From the point of view, you know, IRC has been around for a long time. I mean, the same, same is also true of, 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 of you, Paul. You've, you've had an enormous amount of experience. I wonder maybe the two of you could just reflect on looking at how the arch, uh, arc of history is going to bend. Is this, is this really a particular crisis that we're seeing which is going to have its ups and downs or are we seeing a sort of a crescendo which is going to just really carry on and really continue at, the, at this kind of pitch? What, what do you feel? Maybe, Corinne, you can start. That's a tough question. Uh, that is a tough question. Um, I, I would say, at least in IRC's experience, what we've seen is when a uh, humanitarian crisis is highly visible, that's where we have leverage and pressure points for policymakers and governments to make a shift. Um, I don't think we've seen that to the scale that we need to for northern Mexico or the rest of Central America. Um, it's great that conversations like this are happening. We need to do it more. Um, there needs to be more coverage on it, and I think other humanitarian agencies and shelter providers and other service providers on the front lines, we need to start speaking up on what we're seeing and where we expect it to go if it's not addressed. 
Um, I would also argue that, at least from IRC's perspective, we also want to take a regional approach to this. Um, we do have an office in Juarez, and so we are seeing what's happening in terms of the northern Mexico. We also have an office in El Salvador who's expanding to Guatemala and Honduras. There's similar issues happening in those countries, and we also need to raise that up. Um, so that's, that's not an answer. I don't know where we're headed, um, but I think that is one way that we could start to um, create that's that a conversation. very important point. And if we think back to the family separation here in the US, you know, that particular policy really was a mixture of court inter intervention and, and widespread popular outrage that really led the uh, Trump administration to actually turn back on itself. So we haven't seen anything like that in the Mexico context. Paul, did you want to say anything? Just in terms of the long durée, maybe, and how you see this, yeah. it's hard to predict the future, yeah. but yeah. Then. Yeah, um, clearly, I don't know if anyone knows, but I'm I am extremely pessimistic looking globally because with, with obviously what's happening in the U.S., the increase in populism, anti-migration um, rhetoric is is profound, but also there are a lot of other things that are going on that haven't been as uh, accentuated in the past, I think. And one of one of them is the amount of misinformation the amount of um, the polarization. And when you look across the board, not just in Eastern Europe, but you look yesterday, uh, President Macron in France has, um, in order to try to get some votes from the, the far right, he's now just implemented some stricter migration policies. So it, it's, it's across the board, it's very concerning. Um, and I, my feeling without knowing is that it may get worse before it, it gets better because it's not just economic in nature. Um, it's not just ec ec um, hard times economically and therefore people are now trying to be anti-refugee and anti-migrant, but it's broader than that. It's something much deeper and cultural. So it's, I'm very, very concerned. Okay, I think we... In just yeah, a yeah, fact, sure. yeah. I think it's going to be worse because it's chaotic what we have now, but also we don't have a budget. As you have seen the budget plan in Mexico, we don't have any money for migrants, so, so we need to do something with that. And also we, want, we have in the States one million pending cases in the 56 court immigration courts. So that means that a lot of, lot of these cases, uh, the most part of them are Mexicans, and they are going to be deported to our country. So we are going to have more deportees there. And also we, we have 50,000 people waiting in Remain in Mexico or MPPs. And the last week, uh, American authorities told us that they are go going to give only 18,000 asylums, so all the rest, what we're going to do with these people. And the last data is we have 2,000 deportees per year since Trump is president, and we are going to continue with something like that or even more. I think uh, we're out of time, is that right? Can we take any more questions? I don't know if the organizers want to. Maybe one more. Maybe one more question. Okay, do we have a last question? Does anybody want to have a burning issue they want to ask? If not, we can. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Alberto. Thank you very much for this amazing panel. Um, my question is related to mental health um, consequences of interacting. Uh, do you know if there are consequences uh, in mental health issues when migrant populations interact with military organizations rather than humanitarian organizations? I'm asking that in the context of the National Guard in Mexico, but there might be other lessons in other uh, 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 regions. And, and it, I think that's related if there is been like also like some systematic way to measure it, not only document it, but like to actually measure if there is a, I don't know, I don't want to say it, a significant effect, but something close. Yeah, thank you. Anybody want to take a step at that? Even before the, the spike in unaccompanied children in 2014, um, the, uh, the, the people that did the assessments for uh, children that came to the U.S., uh, was, the organization was General Dynamics, which is a military contractor. Um, so people in the child welfare community have been saying for years that we need to have uh, child-friendly, 
trauma-informed assessments that are focused on responding to the needs of the child rather than getting them into this kind of militarized system. Sadly, it's just gotten much worse. Um, in terms to, of answering your question, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I can't imagine that it's a positive outcome uh, if, you, if you are already experiencing a, a, a set of um, uh, traumatic events to then come face to face with a militarized type response is not probably the healthiest thing to. Well, I think know. one critical aspect here, of course, is, and this really goes to the point about evidence and government responsibility, is training. And, uh, you know, under the kind of international uh, protocols, including protocols, you know, disseminated through UNHCR and through, through the ICRC, International Com Com Committee of the Red Cross, military agents are supposed to be trained in humanitarian education, including in how to deal with children. But, um, you know, we often see that observed in the breach. I don't know how many of you following the situation of India and Kashmir, but that's a classic example where the Indian military have not treated children the way children are supposed to be treated. They treat them exactly the same as adults. And so I imagine, I think there's been a lot of concern expressed in Mexico about the lack of proper training for the, the, the National Guard who are encountering migrants, including caravans, I gather now, at the southern border. So I think, um, you know, it's to some extent a question of which agency, but maybe to an even larger extent, it's a question of what responsibility governments take for training the first responders or the first interactors, whatever their branch of government they come from. So I think that's really where the, the responsibility often falls down. Um, okay, so I think I, I'm going to close this panel. Thank you very much to the panel for, for great presentations. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Schmidke. I work at the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of the event. Uh, I work on Mexican migration policy. And uh, my family fled Honduras many years ago, so this uh, event definitely hits close to home for me. Um, I'm here to just to leave a couple closing remarks, some key takeaways from the event. Um, but first, I wanted to thank um, the panelists, all of you for attending, and um, our fellow organizers for making this event possible. So I just want to say that um, the issue of public health and migration is incredibly important to discuss in 2019, which is a year that more people have been on the move than ever before. So in the last year alone, I just wanna leave you with this number, 851,508 people have arrived to the US-Mexico border, which is one of the highest numbers in over a decade. And while the rate of people coming has decreased in recent months, as Alejandro pointed out, 60,000 asylum seekers still await in Mexico for their immigration court hearings. And of these um, 60,000 people, 16,000 are under the age of 18 and 500 are infants. Um, so in our first panel, we heard about the conditions on the ground, how many asylum seekers have passed through long, often dangerous journeys where they're susceptible to things like disease and dehydration. Some have faced physical, mental, and um, emotional trauma, either at home, on their journey, or when they arrive in Mexico. And as Adolfo's presentation pointed out, limited access to food, water, and sanitation. Julie noted the demographics are changing, and there's a rising number of women, LGBTQ members, and children, who, um, which points to the intersectional and multidimensional care needs. But there's important work that's being done, despite all the challenges. Um, and our second panel, we heard that some pretty great ideas. Um, Paul mentioned intersectoral strategies. Eunice talked about, um, oh, sorry. Paul mentioned um, evidence-based interventions. Eunice talked about intersectional strategies. 
Kieran about adaptive programming and Tom about the importance of a trauma-informed perspective. So we just have to keep talking to each other and having discussions. And I know on behalf of the organizers, uh, we're going to keep moving that needle forward. Tomorrow we'll be having a stakeholder meeting so we can keep talking about strategies to ensure that everyone, no matter where they come from, their legal status or where they are now, um, have enjoy the fundamental right to health. So thank you all so much and hopefully we'll see, uh, have some great talks following the event. Thank you. Thank you.